Thank you, Aditya and Joshua. My name is Brandon Lum, and I'm part of the Google Open Source Security team. It's an honor here to be here serving alongside Sai as the event chair for Cube Day Singapore. And um, I'm at Google Open Source Security team, and as part of that team, uh, one of our missions is to secure open source at scale. And this means um, covering things such as vulnerability and security incidents. And this is where I'm going to talk to you today about my talk, um, Keep Calm and Keep Coding, How to Not Panic During Big CVE Drops. So let's talk vulnerabilities. And I know log for shell you've heard it 10,000 times for the past few years. But it's, it's repeated and it's cliche for a reason, right? It, it drives the point well, right? OK, so for those that are not familiar, uh, log for shell is a vulnerability that was introduced in uh, a popular Java library, uh, logging library, log4j. And you know we see thousands of vulnerabilities come by every year. Uh, but what makes um, this one particularly special is that not only do they have a high impact and high severity, but the likelihood that you were affected and could be exploited was also fairly high because of its pervaded use. So when log 4 shell dropped, right, what we saw was a lot of panic. Uh, everyone scrambled, uh, Google included, right, to say, you know, how do you fix this? Am I affected? What do I do next? And we found that um, the amount of panic of this varies from organization to organization. And a big factor of that is knowing what you have, having a good inventory. And this is what we'll be talking about today. So around when Log4j happened, there was also, some, also something um, that came out from the United States White House called the Executive Order, or EO14028. So, um, this executive order talked about multiple things. It talked about, okay, how do you su secure the supply chain? How do you do zero trust and all these things? Um, but one particular topic and one particular um, concept kind of rallied the industry around, right? So, and this thing was S bombs. And because vulnerabilities were the main pain point, um, S bombs were touted as this is going to be um, how we're going to solve vulnerabilities like this. Um, so what is an SBOM? So SBOM is a software bill of materials. Uh, essentially, you can think of it uh, like an ingredient list. If you go to the supermarket and pick up a jar of peanut butter, uh, you can see what's inside. That's what an SBOM is for software. Um, but SBOMs kind of are only a start. And like food, you know, knowing what I eat is, is great. But as my doctor would say, right, it, it doesn't help if you don't have a diet and don't, you need to know what you need to be able to eat and not eat. So likewise in software, we need to be able to manage and use information in order to manage our software risk. So let's do that with an example. So um, let's talk about curl. I think most developers probably once or twice in your lifetime have at least used curl. Uh, and back in October, there was um, a particularly interesting incident that happened. So the code developers on October 4th came out, opened a GitHub uh, issue saying, hey everyone, there's a high severity vulnerability in curl. It's coming out next week. More details. Patch is going to be released next week. Have fun. Um, and, and basically, they didn't release much details, right? Like the, the issue was edited a few times, but it wasn't enough to really do much. So we're kind of in the same situation, popular tool. Um, two years later, Lock for Shell, can we do better? Um, and so I want to kind of talk about this in terms of um, um, this Netflix show, um, Seven Days Out, if, if folks have watched it. Basically, it's about, you know, there's a big event. Um, and seven days out, like a NASA mission, seven days out, what do you do have to prepare uh, when it actually comes? And so we're going to do this like curl CV version, right? So um, shorter version, but the idea is that uh, we want to strive to be able to create an action plan uh, such that when the, CV, uh, when the CV details drop, when the patch comes, um, we are immediately able to take action to remediate the situation. So 
step one is know what you have. Um, and I don't want to get too philosophical, but uh, we, we gathered some uh, feedback and some experience from, um, from the EO. And what we found that uh, most organizations um, did not really know what they had. And so we found that mo for most organizations that were implementing SBOMs or tried to implement SBOMs, they actually got a lot of value from the process of actually trying to implement SBOMs than the SBOMs themselves. So in particular, what was difficult, right? So what we learned was there's a bunch of stuff. If you have a large organization, um, you have multiple programming languages. You know, Aditya and Joshua talked just previously, they showed different teams with different requirements. Um, and you know, multiple languages, frameworks, great for development. This is something that we touted for, for like microservices, right? Do what you want, use any language you want. Um, the best downside of that is that you need to have observability for all of them. And this includes supporting every different platform and ecosystem. Um, the other thing we saw was multiple teams have different workflows. So uh, different teams do development different ways. They use different CI CD pipelines. They use different builders. Um, they all have different registries. And what you end up with is a bunch of different flows that are distributed and are hard to kind of get observability on. Um, and finally, and uh, the last but the hardest part of this is so what we call the long tail of software, which are the teams that have like a special niche use. They want to use this technology that doesn't fit into a lot of the other things that the organization does. And this makes it very difficult to manage and observe. So like I said, the difficulty of this exercise will vary depending on the organization and um, you know, how complex it is. Um, you know, I could go exa into exactly how Google does this, but it's going to be a whole talk on its own. So I won't do that. But I will um, provide some ideas and some questions to kind of start with uh, to help guide the, the process. Right. So one is, you know, go through the development flows, talk to the different teams, you know, figure out what stacks they're using. And this is one of the areas where less is more, right? Having less stacks, having less ecosystem allows you to do integration in less places. And having organization policy is important and able and allows you to be able to do that better. You know, saying, you know, you should you have less builders, you should have less, uh, only use um, your favorite CI CD pipeline. <laughs> um, the second part of this is figuring out where the endpoints are, not only on the software that you produce, but also the software that you consume. You consume everyone imports libraries, you consume a lot of open source software, you consume a lot of third party SaaS, right? And this is uh, essentially what the US government has asked, right? Is that if you're selling to a federal agency, please provide an S bomb. And so in order to manage your own inventory, you also have to hold um, the, the software providers that you're using also accountable to that. Um, and last but not least is, you know, go look at all your assets, go look at all your services. You know, these are, these are places where you find a lot of scattered into the closets. You know, you, you find where all the, buried, the bodies are buried, uh, a lot of deprecated and unmanaged code. So, Great, so we have that list. Next thing, the easy part, let's generate the S-bombs, right? Run it through a tool, spit out some documents. Um, great. So now, what do we do with these S-bombs? And so one of our favorite tools, grab, again, uh, we can grab through everything. Um, but as you can see here, I grabbed through curl and a bunch of S-bombs and I got uh, a bunch of information that wasn't relevant, like file names, uh, license names, and things like that. So um, this can make it almost as though you know finding a needle in a haystack. So this isn't it's great, but it's limited. So for the rest of the uh, the talk, I'm going to be using uh, this tool called Guac, um, which uh, is a um, Linux Foundation Open SSF incubating project. And what it is, is um, GWAC stands for Graph for Understanding Artifact Composition. And basically, it takes a collection of SBOMs and creates a knowledge graph. And then you can go ahead and ask different questions 
about that graph. So this will also organize the S-bombs and get some value out of it. So step two, am I affected? So you can do a query uh, to the API here that says, you know, find me anything that contains curl in it. Uh, and in this case, we see that, you know, curl is a very prevalent software. It has 27 different instances of it, um, both Debian packages, different libraries and different ecosystems. So am I affected? Yes. What is next? Step three, tell me where am I affected? And so with this, we can use the CLI and basically say, um, in this case, we say Debian package of code, tell me where this is used in my entire organization. And we can see the output here is uh, it's a graph and it's a little bit small, but um, what it shows in the bottom right hand corner is all the versions of Debian code that we own. And Basically, the dependencies, um, um, the container images on the far top left-hand corner um, showing which containers depend on them. So graphics are good, but we can, uh, the output will be able to be more actionable. So from what we can see here, we can see that, okay, it tells us, okay, here's the first list of things that you have to patch, all the Debian packages and all that. And then you have to patch these things next, right? Because it's like container images, if the vulnerability is in your know, base image, you're not gonna get that much. Um, you, you're only gonna be able to patch the image that uses the base image once the base image is patched. Um, in the output, we can also see there's points of contact, and this is information that can be useful to, to find out who the product owners are. So finally, get ready for a patch plan. And this is where it's uh, largely based on the organization uh, with all this information that we have, you know, first identifying product owners, getting them to understand uh, what the issue is, where it resides in their code, and then to help, to help them understand what the risk is and how to manage that risk and evaluate it. Um, another thing they can do is to, once the, the, the images and the libraries are patched, we still need to make sure that they are propagated to the runtime. And so making sure to find where these things are running and make sure they get, um, they get redeployed with the latest build horizon. Um, and of course, there, are, there will be instances where patching is not possible. In the case, you have to talk through and manage your risk appropriately. Awesome. So after doing this, um, day comes uh, one week later, the CV drops, but we do have some semblance of a plan to already know, okay, if uh, what will affect these, who are the owners I have to talk to. And so given that, you know, we, we don't have to on the day itself, you know, panic and try and talk to 10 different people. And so 11 October comes, now we're ready. So before I end, I'd just like to talk about a few things. A lot of what I talked about in terms of supply chain security and, and you know, security concepts in general, uh, this is something that the CNCF uh, Tag Security or the Technical Advisory Group uh, talks about. We have a whole working group just on supply chain security. A lot of conversations happen there. Um, I do encourage folks to check it out. Um, uh, some of the material that I've used is also from my book, uh, my Manning book, Securing the Supply Chain, um, Software Supply Chain. Um, so do check that out as well. And so in conclusion, you know, preparation is half the battle, um, taking the appropriate steps, managing an inventory, and figuring out a patch plan and action plan is the first step to getting better sleep at night as a security operator. Thank you.